Harvard, Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. Dr. Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Dr. Gleb is a proud Ukrainian American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he spends abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. Good on you, Dr. Gleb. Thank Good. you. <laughs> to help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, he's here to share with us how to become a hybrid work leader via cognitive science for project management professionals. Please give us a big welcome for Dr. Gleb. You ready? Yep. Awesome. All right. Great. So let's talk about how US project managers can most effectively lead hybrid teams, become hybrid leaders, manage issues like teamwork, collaboration, innovation, retention, engagement, and so on, productivity. So that's going to be the topic of today's presentation, focusing on this issue. Now, how this will be structured is that first we'll start with some data on hybrid work, remote work. So we're on the same page about the data, with extensive peer-reviewed research. There's also survey research, which I'll be integrating into the presentation. So we're on the same page about the data. Then we'll talk about some mistakes that people often make when they approach hybrid work, remote work. By hybrid work, by the way, I mean both when someone works part-time remote or full-time remote. So that broad space of hybrid work. And then we'll talk about some best practices for effective hybrid work leadership for project managers in particular. So that's what the shape of the presentation is about. That's what you can anticipate. Now, let's talk first about decision making. Imagine that after this talk ends, you want to go and grab some food and you look in the freezer and you see that you have two types of ice cream. One says contains 10% fat and another says 90% fat free. So 10% fat, that's one option. Another option is 90% fat free. Which of these options sounds to you most appealing? Let's take a poll and see what folks prefer. So you should be able to see a poll and you should be able to vote on it now. Do you prefer to have 90% fat free or do you prefer to have 10% fat? But two thirds participating, let's give five more seconds to. All right, so we see that a large majority of you would want 90% fat free. Only a small minority would want 10, under 20% would want 10% fat. And as, but if we think about it, as Michael Boot pointed out, 10% fat, something that nine, contains 10% fat is 90% fat free. And something that's 90% free contains 10% fat. So they are the same. I mean, your project managers, your math savvy, you know how this works. But there's a clearly a quite strong preference among you for the one that's 90% fat free, right? We can very much clearly see that this is the case. So why is this the case? Why do we have such a preference for something that's the same thing, just phrased differently? Well, it's because of the framing effect, the framing effect. So the way that something is framed really powerfully shapes our perspective on it. And we need to think about this framing, especially when it relates to hybrid work and remote work, because the frame that's around hybrid work and remote work very powerfully influences our beliefs and other people's beliefs about hybrid work and remote work and how we can effectively engage in these pretty complex activities, complex topics. 
So a one framing that you want to be thinking about that many, many leaders say is people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. I'm sure you've heard leaders say that. But when you look at hybrid work and remote work, you see that many leaders actually fail to live by that principle, by that framing. They're comfortable with traditional office culture. And so that's why they want to turn back the clock. You see many leaders wanting to turn back the clock and deny the reality of the major disruption associated with the pandemic, associated with hybrid work and remote work. So there's a denialism going on. I will talk about why, but that's really important to understand. This framing, the way the issue of hybrid work and remote work is framed is really important. So instead of thinking of it as a loss, as a problem to be solved, what I strongly recommend you to do, and I, what I strongly recommend you urge others to do, people who you can influence, is to think of it as a major opportunity. It's a disruption, and disruption creates an opportunity to maximize productivity and engagement. Productivity and engagement. Now, if we want to do that, we need to put aside default assumptions, habits, and preferences, and focus really on business objectives. What do we want to achieve? What are the outcomes we want to drive? even if they are not personally comfortable to us. So overcoming cognitive biases, these decision-making errors, which we'll talk about, and integrating best practices on innovative work arrangements. So this is a much healthier framing, one that's much more aligned with effective management and effective leadership. Let's talk about the data. So that's kind of the framing. Let's talk about the data. So there are eight major independent surveys that were done by organizations like the Harvard Business School, Society for Human Resource Management, and others that don't have a stake in the outcome, which found that 75 to 85% of workers don't want traditional office-centric work. And this is, of course, we're talking about remote capable workers, but when we talk about all workers. So that McKinsey did a survey. So again, McKinsey, large consulting firm, doesn't have a stake in the outcome, whether you know, working in the office or remotely. They found that if people are offered the chance to work remotely a substantial amount of the time, 87% would take that chance. They wouldn't want Monday, Friday, nine to five. So we see that very, very many people don't want traditional office-centric work. And a large number, anywhere from a quarter to a third, depending on the industry and the way surveys are phrased, want full-time remote work, full-time remote work. In fact, LinkedIn, a recent report came out from LinkedIn that showed that of all jobs posted on LinkedIn, about 15% are remote, but they're getting over 50% of the applicants, of the, all the applications that are going on. So clearly of the people who are looking for a job to change, lots of people are looking to change from their presumably currently non-remote job to a full-time remote job. 40 to 55% would leave a job if forced to come in full-time. And a lot of the applicants to the LinkedIn remote jobs, I can guarantee to you, are the people who are being forced to return to the office right now who are looking for a new job. But over 70% are less likely to leave a job if offered substantial remote work. So that is retention and recruitment. Let's talk about productivity. This is a major question. What about productivity? And we know in extensive surveys that large proportions of the people report they're more productive working remotely. Over 55% report higher productivity. Only 15% report lower productivity. The other 30% report equal productivity. And this is not simply self-reporting. There's extensive employee monitoring software, for example, ProdoScore and other employee monitoring software found that remote staff are 5% more productive, at least 5% more productive. And there was a study from Stanford University that found that remote staff were 5% more efficient in May 2020 at the start of the pandemic. But what happened throughout the pandemic and what happened as time went on? Well, people actually got more efficient working remotely. By May 2022, two years later, people were 9% more efficient. Remote workers were 9% more efficient or workers who worked remotely were 9% more efficient than those who did the same jobs in office. Now, why was that increase in efficiency? Well, we learned how to work together remotely better. We learned how to collaborate better. We learned how to lead better, how to communicate better. And also there was investment into various forms of technology, project management, things like Microsoft Teams, Zoom. People learned how to use these technologies better. Governments and utilities invested into faster internet. 
And if you think about it, it's kind of understandable why people are more productive working remotely. Of course, you have the phenomenon that you don't have to do the commute. That's the number one reason, honestly, that people are more productive. I mean, it depends on the area where you live, but if you live in a high density area, it takes over an hour to get to work and back. On average, it takes about half hour each way for an average American, according to a, a census study. So that is a lot of time wasted. And people are willing to devote around 40%. There was a study that showed that people are can would devote 40% of the time saved on commuting to working. So clearly people are spending that time being more productive. Right? So that's a good use of time. But besides that benefit of the additional time that people are spending, and so that's, you know, if you think of an average of an American, that's an hour per day, you know, half hour there, half hour back, that's that's a, quite a bit of time. That's, so that's 20 minutes per day, that, uh, that's not 20 minutes, that's something like 25 minutes per day that people are spending additionally on their work tasks. So that's, you know, multiplied by five, that's going to give you two hours a week. So that's a lot. Also, people are more productive because they can align the timing of their day. Some people are morning doves, some people are night owls. And people who are morning doves like to work from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. People who are night owls like to work from you know, 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. or 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. And that's fine, they, as long as they can get their work done and can communicate with others. So there's more flexibility, it aligns more with people's energy and people are more productive. And also there's better work-life balance. There's remote and hybrid employees have better well-being because they can align their lives more around their work time. So over 75% feel less stressed, over 70% report better well-being, and over 75% report being happier due to if they can have substantial remote work. Now, with this in mind, let's take a poll. What is your preferred working style? Please go ahead and vote. So Audrey noted that for best view, select view option speaker so that you can actually see my slides effectively. Okay, I see about four fifths of us participated. Let's give five more seconds to those who didn't yet. All right, so we see that about 50% want fully remote here, which is a little bit larger, more than average, but that's fine. And the rest, oh, yeah, the rest all want the hybrid schedule around something like 27% want less than half uh, the week in the office and the rest about just over a quarter want uh, over half the work week in the office, but no, no one wants a fully full-time five days in the office. Good, good to know. All right, so let's talk about some of the errors that leaders make around work, remote work, hybrid work. And these are called cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are the dangerous judgment errors that come from how our brain is wired. So these are dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases, and they stem from the fact that our brain is not really wired for the modern environment. It's wired for the ancient savanna environment when we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, and we had to rely on the fight or flight reflex to survive. One big problem in given that environment is called the status quo bias. That is a tendency to prefer what we know, to maintain or get back to the status quo, even if that, even if the situation changed drastically and has disrupted and we should not get back to the status quo. In the Savannah environment, there was no real major disruption. There was just changing of the seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. So if there actually was a change, it was very beneficial for our emotions to push us back to the previous state of being because survival was precarious and any major change was something that was likely to be bad. So it was good for us to orient toward the status quo because uncertainty was a bad thing. In the modern environment, we have many disruptions. We have the pandemic, we have the rise of hybrid remote work. I mean, a few years ago, we had the rise of the smartphone. We had the fiscal crisis, you know, dot-com boom and bust. So we have disruptions all the time in the modern world. 
And so that status quo bias is a big problem and it causes us to downplay major disruptions. That's not a good thing. So status quo bias causes a lot of leaders to downplay major disruptions and to go to what they know. And you can kind of see why they would do that. It's comforting and comfortable. So let's say Bob Iger at Disney, who, when he took back the, when he was asked to come back as a CEO of Disney, he asked everyone, he told his all staff to come back four days a week. It's comfortable. It's what he knows. He knows how to be successful in that environment. He knows how to lead in that environment. So he wants to go to a state where he's successful, even where he's personally comfortable with that environment, even if it's quite bad for people's productivity, for people's engagement, for retention, for recruitment, for well-being, for stress, for work-life balance. Another problem is the empathy gap. There's a great underestimation of other people's emotions, and we can see that with tribalism. So going back to that savanna environment, it was important for us to be hostile to other tribes because if they tried to take us over and we weren't sufficiently hostile to them, well, then we'd die. And we're the descendants of those who didn't die. So the empathy gap has to do with a, our lack of empathy for people who are different from us. So other people who we perceive as different from us, not part of our tribe, like people who desire well-being and flexibility. Many, many bosses don't have an empathy for people who desire flexibility and well-being, and so they underestimate the intensity of the emotions of such people. And finally, functional fixedness. Functional fixedness has to do with what's called the hammer nail syndrome. You might have heard of this. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So this has to do with how we actually work in hybrid settings, how we actually work. So let's say organizations do decide to work in a hybrid setting. Well, how do they work in a hybrid setting? That's the challenge with functional fixedness that many organizations don't do it very well. They transpose their office-based culture on hybrid work and remote work. And they don't realize that doing so is a bad idea because it's kind of like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. You're going to knock off the corners. You're not going to have a good outcome. The, the situation with hybrid work and remote work is that it's quite different and you need to adapt to a native virtual format. So the way you learn to function, where it's called functional fixedness, is that we perceive only one real, right way of functioning, one right way of leading a team, of managing projects, of just general policies, leadership, whatever, all of these sorts of policies toward other people. We perceive only one right way of doing it, of maintaining culture, of innovating, of collaborating. And so there's a transposing of office culture and hybrid work and remote work and failing to adapt strategically to the new world where we really want to learn how to innovate anywhere and collaborate everywhere. With this in mind, let's take another poll. Which of these cognitive biases and the future of work do you think might be the most problematic for your workplace? About 60% participating. Let's give five more seconds to those who haven't made their voice heard yet. Okay. So we see that just about half of you said the status quo bias, then just about a third said functional fixedness, and then a sixth said empathy gap. So good to know. Whatever the pro biggest problems you see are, think about this and take them back to your organization and help folks address them. Good. So let's talk about some best practices for how to do hybrid work and remote work. What are the best practices? Best practice is clearly a team-led model. So when we look at all the options, the best approach is a team-led model. What that means is having some broad guidelines from the top about how to work in a hybrid and remote setting, whatever it is for your company, and then let each team make its own decisions within these guidelines. We see that that breeds quite a bit higher engagement 
and buy-in from team members and likelihood of actually following the guidelines and being aligned with them. So hybrid first and minority fully remote, that's what works. I helped 22 organizations transition to hybrid work and remote work, figuring out their long-term hybrid work arrangements. The large majority of them figured that hybrid first and the minority fully remote is what's going to work best. And I've seen that be the model that works best for most organizations. So hybrid employees spend one to two days in the office, and that's the majority, 70 to 90%. So 70% for more for companies that are have financial companies or software, 90% for something like manufacturing companies or retail companies that have more required staff on site. And then some fully remote employees, minority, 10 to 30%. And then you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements. To do so, you want to really provide training. So you want to provide effective training for your teams on hybrid work, effective hybrid work, what to do at home, what to focus on in the office. For example, what to do at home. In, at home, you want to do your individual focus tasks. So very clearly, individual tasks are much better done at home. There's no question about it. For the large majority of people who have a normal home office and who don't have a serious challenge with separating work life from home life, the vast majority of individual focus tasks are best done at home. That means things like writing reports, figuring out project flows, Gantt charts, and so on. Also, email. So asynchronous communication, much better done at home. There's no reason to do the commute to the office to do asynchronous communication, as well as virtual meetings. There is no reason to go to the office and then just sit in your cubicle and take a virtual call and be disrupting others who are around. So those three things, individual focused work, asynchronous communication, and video conferencing are much better done at home for the large majority of people. And guess what? For the large majority of us, that's what takes up 90% of the time. These individual tasks, uh, asynchronous communication, and virtual meetings. And the other other tasks do, for most people, benefit from being done in the office. And these are socializing with others. So it's for most people, it's more fun to and engaging to spend time together in the office in person. Then collaboration, more intense forms of collaboration, strategy planning, talking about projects. So there are some things that are best done together, more intense collaboration rather than on a on an asynchronous video conference meeting and things that you would do, sensitive conversations like about performance evaluation, promotions, and so on, manager one-on-ones with a, sub with a subordinate that are better done in the office. So I recommend doing that in the office. Then things like more intense training, there's definitely some benefits to being together for those activities. But those activities, they're very important. So it's really valuable for most people to do them in the office. They usually take up less than 10% of a typical worker's time. That's why I say, you know, one to two days in the office is more than enough. So ideally, you'd want it to be one day in the office if you can schedule these activities effectively, you know, two days if you can't schedule them as effective. And then effective virtual communication and collaboration. People have a lot of trouble communicating and collaborating virtually. And it's hard to know how to do so effectively. So having effective virtual communication and collaboration training is very important. If you think about it, the effective virtual com effective communication training before the pandemic, that was a big thing. I mean, people were making a lot of money on communication training and companies were investing a lot of money. But virtual communication is very different and companies are not investing nearly enough money into effective virtual communication. The same thing for collaboration. There's a lot of training on teamwork, trust building, and so on before the pandemic. But effective collaboration in the and of teamwork that's virtual is so important, but there's so little investment into this issue. And as part of this, you want to solve collaboration and team building. So a way to do so is to replace in-person co-working with virtual co-working, which means working along team members on a video conference call. So much at like a Zoom call like we're doing right now, you sign into a, with your team members onto a Zoom call. It's going to be for fully virtual teams once a day or hybrid teams on their non-office days. So one hour video conference call, and then you share the project on which you'll work. This is for individual tasks. This is not for collaborative tasks. You're not intending to talk with each other during this period. You're just working on your individual projects. They might be 
parts of a project that the whole team is working on, but they're all your individual projects. You're not talking to others all the time while doing this. Then you turn off your microphones, you leave your speakers on and your video is optional. Then you go do your tasks, do your work. As you have a question about something or you have an innovation idea or a problem you need to solve, then you turn on your microphone and share. Other people can then answer questions, discuss ideas and so on. And at the end, you all turn on your microphones and share what you accomplished during this period. This is very effective for helping teams bond and it facilitates innovation creativity, problem solving. It's especially helpful for junior team members. They get a lot of benefit from this, especially if they're just coming in fully remote, they've never seen other team members. This is a very integrative activity. It helps onboard junior team members. It provides on-the-job training, which is essentially just giving people quick answers when they have them in a synchronous manner at the same time. So very effective. Now, let me share with you a video about this modality. So this is Craig Knobloch. He leads a 300-ish people research institute at the University of Southern California with focusing on AI technology. So lots of programming, lots of cybersecurity, lots of networking. Let's see what he has to say about this team-led model. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came, came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week. Uh, and then, you know, can work from home two days a week. Uh, and, and then I saw a video that Gleb actually, a video talk that Gleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that, really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And, uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. You're on mute, Dr. Club. Oh, hmm, thank you. So team-led approach, you should be able to hear me now. So how valuable do you think it will be for you and your team to integrate this team-led approach into your workplace? So based on what Craig said, based on my presentation, how valuable do you think it would be? See, just about half of us voted. Please uh, vote if you haven't yet. Five more seconds. Okay, great. So we see that, yes, the majority of us see field will be highly valuable and the rest with the one third field will be moderately valuable. So especially if you feel it's highly valuable, this is very important and valuable for you to go and share with others on your team. Great. Let's talk about 
innovation. How do you solve the challenge of innovation in this setting? Now, the traditional way of innovating, of course, is traditional brainstorming. So you get into a room and you start shooting ideas at each other. When you're, let's say, you're you want to you're starting up a project as a project manager, you start you get into a room with your project team. You should start shooting ideas at each other. Or when you encounter a major problem, again, get into a room, do some brainstorming. Right? That's the traditional model of how to innovate effectively. But it doesn't work very well, unfortunately, in virtual settings. Traditional brainstorming just is not nearly as effective. It's not as engaging. And so you want to do something different. And there's a different model that I developed and published an article about this in Harvard Business Review, which I'll talk about. But first, let's talk about traditional brainstorming and its challenges. So it's useful for innovation in a number of ways. It has what's called social facilitation, where there's other people doing the same thing that you are, that's motivating. It has synergy, which in this case refers to you, somebody having an idea and you being inspired by their idea to have an idea that you wouldn't have had otherwise. But it has serious problems. Production blocking, that's where you have an idea, but other people are talking about a different idea and their conversation goes in a different direction. You're reluctant to interrupt and that hope happens especially to people who are, tend to be introverted and tend to people who tend to be junior people on the team, so lower status. They have a lot of trouble with production blocking. And if you've never had trouble with production blocking, that's probably because you're extroverted or you generally are not junior on the team. Evaluation apprehension. That's where people are afraid of sharing an idea because it seems too out of the box or maybe implicitly criticizing another team member in some way. So evaluation apprehension. That's especially a problem for people who tend to have more of a pessimistic personality. And again, junior status team members. And social loafing. That's where the more people, our brains are inherently lazy, meaning they're about for the savannah environment when they're low energy. So we have a tendency to not do hard work when other people can do hard work. That's why you have less ideas. The more people there are in the room, the less ideas you have per person. But actually the best traditional brainstorming strategy is to have two people in the room to have the maximum ideas per person. Now, virtually synchronous brainstorming is a technique that I told you I developed that solves these problems. It's especially helpful for junior, lower status team members, introverts, and pessimists. All right, let's talk about this technique. Steps for virtually synchronous brainstorming. First, all team members generate their ideas separately, asynchronously, not at the same time, and anonymously. So anonymously, you put them into a digital form, like MS Forms, Google Forms, Mural, if you want it to be visual, and something like that. So again, asynchronously and anonymously. Asynchronicity, that's great. That addresses production blocking because you're separate from others. You're not, no one's going to block your ideas. It's very helpful for introverted team members and people who are lower status. And anonymity is very helpful for pessimistic people for evaluation apprehension. And again, lower status team members. So anonymity you can get pretty easily by having, there are a number of ways you can get anonymity, but let's say Google Forms. So you don't, you, you're, you can, no one can see your name. You can have a format where you just submit your ideas. Nobody knows who the ideas came from or a format where you have a space for your idea and your name. And then the team lead, the facilitator, I facilitated many, many of these virtual synchronous brainstorming. They just take away your name. So they know that you came up with the idea, you get credit for your idea, but they take away your name when they provide the final ideas to for evaluation. So step two, have all the team members, let's say it's a six people team. So you have team members, everyone, let's say share 10 ideas. And so then the facilitator, so let's say I or a team leader or somebody else cleans up these ideas, removes duplicates. Let's say you have 50 ideas left in a spreadsheet from Google Forms, which creates spreadsheets. And so then you take those 50 ideas and then you give a clean, blank, you give a clean spreadsheet, anonymous, to each team member. And each team member rates these ideas anonymously and quantitatively on a scale of zero to five, for example, on categories like how innovative, practical, and exciting each idea is, and then also writes their notes, comments. So now each idea has had anywhere from zero to 15, so zero, so zero to five and three categories, zero to 15 from each person, and that's six people, so that's up to 90. 
So each idea anywhere now has anywhere from zero to 90 points. So you combine the final result, each idea has, so the six spreadsheets, easy to combine their numerical scores. So now you have six, now you have six spreadsheets, great. You have the ideas are evaluated, great. And then you have a synchronous meeting. For hybrid teams, this is something I recommend doing in person. For virtual teams, I recommend obviously doing this, doing this virtually. Then all the ideas, the best ideas floated to the top. So let's say you can have a cutoff point of 75 and above. So you only look at ideas that are 75 and above, and then you decide, okay, which of these do we implement and how do we improve them? Because they have a number of comments. You can improve them further. And that's where you get synergy, where you're inspired by other people's ideas to further improve the ideas. And this is social facilitation as well, because you're having a synchronous meeting where everyone is talking about them. And there's no problem of evaluation apprehension because they're already evaluated and everyone sees which ideas floated to the top. So this is great. You Another benefit of this is that you decide on, let's say, the top three ideas that you want to implement, and so you do that. That's great. Now, another benefit is that you get to keep the rest of the ideas and put them into an idea bank. They're not simply going to disappear. Like the product of traditional brainstorming, in traditional brainstorming, the ideas disappear, People don't really keep track of them. Here, you have all the ideas written down in digital form. Now, maybe some of these ideas are great. They are maybe they're very innovative and exciting, but they're not practical right now. Now, worries about a recession, right? Companies freezing you know, spending. So maybe they're going to be practical in a year when or in six months if the you know, recession is, if we do have a soft landing, right? So this is great. And the peer-reviewed study showed that this results in more total ideas and more novel ideas than traditional brainstorming. So there is research showing that this is a more effective technique. Now, let me share with you another video. And this is going to be from Susan Winchester. She's the Chief Human Resources Officer at Applied Materials. Applied Materials is a fortune. You might have heard of this. It's been in the news recently. It's a semiconductor manufacturer. So it's a Fortune 200 company, has something like 30-ish thousand employees. So, and this is from, she's describing a training on virtually synchronous brainstorming that I did for their global leadership team of over 400 people. Let's see what she has to Hi, say. I'm Susan Winchester, and it's my delight and pleasure to tell you a little bit about our experience with Dr. Gleb. He had a big positive impact at Applied Materials. Our leaders and engineers love data-based, research-based insights, which is exactly what he brings. He hit it out of the park. And he used a team-led process, which was incredibly engaging. He introduced us to a concept he created called asynchronous brainstorming. It was a process that we used with hundreds and hundreds of leaders globally at the same time. We did this during our CEO kickoff session for our strategy work. And in a very short amount of time, we were able to get great benefits. I also love the work he's doing to educate leaders around the power and positive benefits of hybrid and virtual working. And one of his techniques. Okay, so that was a section relevant to the hybrid and virtually synchronous brainstorm. Now, given that, what are your thoughts about implementing this technique in your company? How valuable would it be for your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. See, most people voted. Let's give five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. Great, so I see that over half of you would find highly valuable, excellent. And Thomas says in the comments that Oh, the company just did something similar in a strategic meeting last week. Very productive. That's excellent. Yeah, so this was a strategic kickoff meeting, but it can be done for any meeting where you want to generate ideas. So this is very helpful technique. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Excellent. All right. So 
let's go on to the key takeaways before the questions. Key takeaways for this inflection in the future of work. You want to integrate addressing decision-making cognitive biases into the culture of your company to focus on those business outcomes and productivity, engagement, retention, recruitment, well-being, work-life balance, decreasing stress, even though some people might have personal discomfort about this, even top leaders. To use team-led hybrid first model with a minority fully remote to retain best talent, improve productivity, maximize well-being, and address burnout. And adapt your culture to hybrid and remote work. So you want to get some training on hybrid work and virtual communication and collaboration. You want to integrate virtual co-working for collaboration, team building, and integration of junior staff. And for innovation, virtually synchronous brainstorming is a great technique. Now it's up to you. You have these tools. Go out there and make it happen. For those of you who are watching this after the presentation, you will get you can get the free additional resources from this talk at tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. But for the rest of you, you'll have an opportunity to vote on them. You'll get a copy of my best-selling book called Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. I'll be happy to give a free coaching session for the first three claimants. All right. So let's go ahead with the vote. And in the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. You can unmute yourself or you can type a question in the chat. Either way is fine. Five more seconds for those who might be shy. Okay, I don't see any questions. Good. Hopefully everyone found everything unquestionable. <laughs> Good. Well, this is the end of the presentation. Audrey, do you want to finish us up? Thank you, Dr. Gleb, everybody. Let's give him a thanks virtually with our applause here. Thank you so much. Uh, Yes, we are trying to record and provide this available to others. We will do our PDU reporting. Thank you for putting your name in your profile. Awesome. Uh, Yovo, any final words? Dr. Clapp, on uh, behalf of PMI Honolulu, we want to thank you so much for um, making this presentation. Sorry about the time difference issue. And we look forward to hearing from you soon. And um, yeah, big, big appreciation. We'll send you a certificate of appreciation from our chapter and look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. And we'll figure out the timing next time. All right. Do, there is one question that, that popped up in the chat. Do you think, Dr. Gleb, you'd be able to address that? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. How to get teams to use a collaboration tool. Some are reluctant. You want to give positive reputational incentives to people who are using it. So you want to recognize them and share with them the benefits of, hey, we're going to use this and you want to encourage the use of it. So the people who start using it, make sure that you reward them, recognize them and say, as a manager, as a project manager, you're managing your team. Rec recognition is the best way of the people who are using it. That is the best way that I found to help encourage others to use it. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for drawing my attention to it, Graham. Certainly. And I actually, I actually do have one question. Have you encountered oh, sure. any have you encountered any companies or scenarios in which a traditional office-centric model has been more effective than either a hybrid or or LinkedIn? Yeah. I'm sorry for my really absolutely absolutely not there is no company in which this is more effective because the large majority of the vast of people and we're talking about remote capable people so obviously not frontline workers the large majority of the work of remote capable people is most effectively done at home people hate commuting 
you know, that's people, people despise commuting, the large majority of us, right? Unless you're weird in some way, <laughs> uh, you despise commuting. So forcing people to come to the office and then write their emails, you know, that's just a terrible, terrible use. I mean, and this is not me saying, so for example, the head of Slack in the UK, what's his name, Templeton, he, they, he was saying that forcing people to come to the office and then do virtual video conferencing is just a terrible use of time. You know, it's just, it's a time killer and it's creates frustration and creates resentment. And then that's going to create retention issues. People are going to leave. And we very clearly see that. I mean, there's a reason why there's 15% of all jobs on LinkedIn are remote, but 50% of all, they're getting over 50% of all job applicants. So it's because people are being forced to come to the office who don't need to be there and they resent it and they're applying for fully remote jobs. Thank you. Sure. All right. Good. Well, have an, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.